beyond the wall of two cultures. Science and humanities after climate change. Deepesh Chakrabarti, University of Chicago. 20 years ago, I was in Australia. I had that rare feeling of being an eyewitness to a major event in modern human history. Since the question of nostalgia was raised, I thought I would begin by speaking a little nostalgically about a wall that fell for me personally a few years ago um, when my father died, even though I'll be talking about the walls of the future in, my, in the rest of my talk. So I grew up in Calcutta, now I teach in Chicago, and by, I developed social scientific tendencies in early adolescence. And when you be develop social scientific tendencies in early adolescence, you begin by assuming that your parents are stupid. And they don't understand what, what really capitalism is, what bourgeois is, and even though they're educated, so you argue with them at uh, dinner table, and you move away from their assumptions. And because you know, India is not a society where your parents, even if they're educated, speak social science language. So um, I had then felt very comfortable teaching my students that uh, Hindu tradition is a constructed tradition, invented tradition, like we do with all religions and everything, and uh, which I still cognitively would probably subscribe to. But when my father died a couple of, uh, two or three years ago, and I was in Calcutta, and I was, I was in the river Ganges doing what uh, I had to do as a Hindu son uh, for my parents, funeral rites, letting their things go in the, in the river, and there were hundreds of men by my side doing the same thing. And just at that moment, suddenly, the river felt eternal, the rituals felt eternal, Hinduism felt eternal. I knew that one day I would die, my son would do this thing. I know one day that my father had done similar things for his parents. And suddenly, I realized that most people go about their lives thinking exactly how I, the way I felt, that the river is there forever, that uh, you did certain things forever. So it was quite a shock, first of all, to be told by climate scientists that the river may not be there forever, that the Himalayan glaciers are melting, that there might be over flooding, there might be drought. But the harder shock as a social scientist, the, the harder shock to observe was the news that human beings have become a geological agent on this planet. In other words, that the climate of the planet is changing has something to do with what we are doing as a species, as a collectivity, I mean, as a social scientist, as a historian, talking to environmentalists and envir environmental historians, I had come to accept the proposition that um, human beings are biological agents. We have ecological impacts. But this news is new when geologists and scientists, Paul Crutz and others, began to say that a new geological period may have begun, which they're proposing to call Anthropocene. In other words, Holocene has ended, Anthropocene has started. It really shook up all my assumptions as a social scientist because in political thought, in social science, you always assume that the geological calendar is completely indifferent to the calendar of capitalism, socialism, feudalism, you know, on which we teach human history in the classroom. And there's a long heritage going back to Vico, going back to the 17th century in Western tradition of keeping natural history and human history separate. I mean, the 17th century argument was that nature is created by God, we can't understand God's work, but we create society and we can study society. And suddenly I realized that this news that human beings have become a geological agent, which climate scientists say over and over again, is something that fundamentally shakes up. One of the assumptions of social science where you assume that the geological calendar and the human calendar are completely indifferent to one another. So when you think of human freedom, autonomy in political thought, you assume that human freedom and autonomy is independent of geological agency. And then to be told that we are a geological agent changes the nature and conception and the scale of human agency. And then as I began to read climate scientists more and more, being interested in this problem and the challenge it posed to my own thinking as a social scientist, I realized that the wall between science culture and humanities culture was being actually pushed from both sides, I hope in the same direction so that it would break, not kind of be kept in place so that, you know, uh, if they were pushed in opposite directions. 
uh, with the same force. And then my, I realized, to give you one example, that climate scientists were coming around to very similar problems, not articulating it, not formulating it in the way that I would. But to give you an example, my colleague in my geophysics department in, at the University of Chicago, David Archer, who is a paleoclimatologist, who has also become, had done very, two very interesting books on global warming. His last book, published this year, and which got an award called The Long Thaw, is the subtitle. Are human beings, how human beings are changing the climate of the earth for the next 100,000 years. And you know, this is not somebody ranting, this is a sober geophysicist talking. And he begins the whole book by raising an urgent ethical question. And the ethical question is this, that the, the mild, what he calls mild or subtle, effects of climate change we're suffering now is not because of the CO2 or the greenhouse gases we are putting in the atmosphere today. It's because of the past collection of GHGs. So his, his question was, okay, that may have been unintended. We didn't know what we were doing. But now that we know that the effects of this will linger for thousands of years. How do we, after this knowledge, still do it? Because, you know, the American Department of Energy has just said that even after 2030, 80% of American energy will come from fossil fuel, not from renewables. And, and he actually, then, then like, almost like a historian, he says, imagine if the ancient Greeks had found some way of making quick bucks, that found a resource that they could squander away, make a huge amount of profit, and we were to face the after effects of that, how would we feel about our classical past that we take so much glory in? And I realized that while in the social sciences and in philosophy particularly, we had talked about bioethics, a new age has come where we need to talk about geoethics of human politics. And then the more I read climate change scientists, the more I found them raising extremely interesting questions for political thought and for social science, very fundamental questions. To give you one example, Mark Maslin, a British climate change scientist who writes books for people like myself, you know, who are not scientists, so climate change for idiots, I will immediately buy 50 copies if you wrote them. So his book, Climate Change, A Short Introduction, Global Warming, A Short Introduction, ends with a very interesting expression of despair, a scientist's despair, but I think hidden in it is a question that I can't avoid thinking about as somebody interested in political thought and in political institution and in the question of politics of climate change. So Maslin says, last chapter, he says, it is unlikely that global politics will solve global warming. Global warming requires nations and regions to plan for the next 50 years, something that most societies are unable to do because of the very short-term nature of politics. In other words, the fact that most democratic cycles, electoral cycles run for three to five years, means that we mostly have governments that are extremely open to pressures by special interest lobby groups. And it's very, very hard for democratically elected governments to take the view of the whole. I mean, it sort of reminded me of certain kind of utopian critiques of the parliamentary system that Gandhi used to make at the beginning of the 20th century. And on the other side, Political scientists, like my friend Timothy Mitchell, who is a political scientist at uh, Columbia, has just published a very interesting essay called Carbon Democracy, in which he goes over all the existing theories of democracy and show that, shows that all of them take the idea of unlimited growth for granted. So there's been a kind of you know, assumption on the, on the part of sort of political scientists, political thought that there'll be unlimited growth, which is why we often think that it can be unlimited rights. I mean, that's a separate topic. You know, how, we, how rights used to be concentric in the 19th century and the 20th century, there's been an explosion of rights. So in that sense, there, there is an emergent conversation, I think implicit, it's just beginning, between the physical sciences and the human sciences that is crossing the barrier of two cultures. And in that sense, the nostalgic reference that C.P. Stones talked about 50 years ago, if we take then the question of sustainability seriously, and if we take climate change seriously, it seems to me that we have to rethink our political categories. And I'll come to the question of how to rethink political categories in a minute. But just as in parenthesis and as a caveat, I still want to say though, that in saying that there is an incipient conversation between climate change scientists and political thought, political thinkers, philosophers, and social scientists, 
I'm not saying that all the differences will be abolished between the humanities and science. A certain kind of fundamental division of labor will probably remain in place for a long time to come. So if you think of two questions, the first question being, what is a human being? How does the human organism work? I think this is a question that will be increasingly answered by scientists. So one will not have to go back to Aristotle to learn physiology or you know, human anatomy. But the question, the separate question, connected but separate question, how does it experience, how does it feel to be a human being? Or what is the meaning of being human? Will need to be answered by humanists for a long time to come. And humanists could be theologians, they could be philosophers, or indeed historians of one kind or another, or literature people. But the present crisis, I think in spite of this continuation of the difference, makes a difference. And this is where I have to say that David Archers, my colleague in Chicago, and other climate scientists' writings that seek to bring scientific facts on a geological scale, facts that we can only grasp with our facilities for cognition, and they are seeking to bring something that we can only think through our faculty for cognition, they're trying to bring that into our immediate emotive reckoning of urgency and ethics. I mean, uh, uh, Archer recognizes that human beings are almost hardware in such a way that we can't really identify with people two generations before us, before two generations before us, and after two generations after us. And that may have been a thing about our survival, because survival requires every species to focus on the present. So it, we are sort of deeply present-oriented creatures. But at the same time, cognitively, we can think very far. And therefore, in a way, they're asking for the impossible. They're asking us to identify with something that we can only uh, cogitate about, but not actually agitate about in, 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 our, in our hearts. But their sense of urgency with regard to the impossible that is bringing the geological sublime within the realm of affect only points to the political and intellectual challenge of the current crisis. Out of this may very well emerge a new kind of politics where political imagination is actually influenced by geological imagination. In fact, several scientists have just recently published a paper where they call for seven kinds of, or a kind of a global human compact that humanity will not cross seven thresholds, like thresholds of temperature, what you do with the sea. I'm asking for that, some kind of a global convention and global agreement. Uh, so such politics, this politics that will be actually influenced by the geological, which is normally ignored even in, even in sort of conversations to do with Copenhagen, normal politics of climate change. Such politics will have to take into account not only the economic and the sociological, but the biological and the geological as well. Which, and this politics will supplement climate change politics based on the more short-run perspectives of market principles, political negotiations, and technological fixes. Just a quick aside on market principles. You know, some, when, you, when you use market as a regulation of behavior or price as a regulation of behavior, one of the things you assume is that by pricing something up, you will encourage people to look for substitutes. But in the climate change crisis, there are certain things for you. There's no substitute. There's no substitute for the seas, the oceans. You know, you can't actually, by using price, get people to find a substitute for the, for the oceans. So in other words, it seems to me that we have to move away from the idea that the geological is happening on a scale that is not of any import to our political thought, which is on a much shorter scale. It seems to me that we have to think on multiple scales all at once. So scalar thinking on different scales all at once is immediately needed. And this has to bear on our habitual tendencies as a species to think only of the short term. Thank you very much. <laughs>